Wait quite up, Julian brave noise cat when squexed. When Kika had a squest what Alexander Roddy as when Keka had a squest what at Archie noise cat. So quach mach ken at Statland ken, that's esken which deck one, to Oakland which deck one. Let one poopsman the Elliot take to me what ech what biscat away uluch. Quick loot ken the pioneers, to coast me wach as Oloni uluch, what what Alex. Met back eagle ken to sick what machuluch. Being deceived, the chayim ken de nequip epochs, what amuch ui, as what to me. Good afternoon. I thought it would be most appropriate to start my keynote in my language, sequet machchin, which I was lucky enough to learn from my kia, that's my grandmother. She's the oldest person on the Canem Lake Indian Reserve and one of our last remaining fluent speakers. When she was a little girl, a government official called an Indian agent took her and a bunch of other kids from Canem Lake away from their families on the back of a cattle truck to an Indian residential school called St. Joseph's Mission. There, they were brutalized for speaking their language and taught to hate themselves for being Indian. Earlier this year, 215 unmarked graves of native children, some as young as three, were discovered at the site of the Kamloops Indian Residential School. My Kea earned her nursing degree there. Not long after, 182 hidden burials were identified at a residential school in Cranbrook, British Columbia. Then 751 in Maryville, Saskatchewan. 160 in Penalacket, British Columbia. Across the continent, First Peoples are now searching for the bones of our young ones at the schools that were supposed to civilize us. Over the last four months, I've been journeying back to St. Joseph's mission in my people's homelands, where they're using ground penetrating radar to find my as friends, cousins, and classmates who never came home. When I was there in August, I interviewed a former Kukbi or chief. He had never publicly spoken about the residential school and his origins, but on camera, he told me that he was the illegitimate child of the priest the product of kidnap and rape. Even though he was the child of a white father, he was taken to a residential school with all the other native kids. And like all the other little native kids, he was abused. When I was there, he told me, we all were. After he shared his story, which ran more than three hours, I stepped out of his front door on the Sugarcane Indian Reserve. Ash was falling from the sky. Western Canada, the Western United States, and really the whole world seemed to blaze. This summer, the Northwestern part of North America was, part, was gripped by a heat dome that set all time temperature records from Portland, Oregon to Fort Smith in the Northwest Territories. As of mid August, heat, wind, lightning, and humans sparked over 1500 wildfires in British Columbia. One small town, Lytton, where I have friends and relations burned completely to the ground. It's now little more than a grid of concrete foundations and scorched chimneys. The province of British Columbia, like many other jurisdictions, declared a state of emergency. Now I'm currently working on my first book and a documentary. And in both of those projects, I'm thinking through the convergence of these apocalypses, the genocide of colonization and the echo side of climate change. I'm trying to understand how indigenous peoples have persisted in the face of existential threats, because I believe that our survival ought to matter to more people than just ourselves, that it ought to matter to you. I chose to begin my keynote in my language tonight because I wanted to show you that in our words and in our very being, indigenous peoples are refusing to be annihilated. In Sequet Mokhchin, I said who I am in relation to my kin, to my community, and to the places I come from because those things matter. 
not just to Indians, but to all people. At this dire juncture, with a pandemic engulfing humanity and the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere climbing to levels not seen in 3.6 million years, we all need to remember who we are, how we are related, where we come from, and how the other than human world to which we are also related gives us life. Allow me to demonstrate. When I introduced myself, I said, my name is Julian Brave Noisecat. And that meant something because Noisecat or Noisecat as the name was originally pronounced before the missionaries messed it up, it nearly died out. You see at St. Joseph's, the missionaries baptized us with Christian names. Before then, our people carried ancestral names and earned names, what you might know as Indian names and we could take on many in a lifetime. But as they were taking control of the, our lands, the government of Canada and the church said that that would not do. Us Indians could not be plural. We could only be individuals. They said, you Indians need one name so we can keep track of you, so we can confine you on reservations, count your dwindling numbers and mark our control of your lives. They gave us names in their faith so they could save us from our supposed savagery. When stealing and destroying are called civilizing and enlightening, they can be justified. In fact, they were so good at taking away names that when she died, my great grandmother, Alice Nuiz Cat, was the last person to carry her name. Alice raised my father when his own parents who were all messed up from the residential school could not. She was a hard worker. He remembers her towing him out on the family trap line in a sled made from an old car hood. They'd check all the traps, pulling frozen beaver and muskrats out of the water so they could sell their fur and feed their family. They didn't have much and hunger was common. But Alice, Alice was generous. One time she found a fresh apple, a hard thing to come by on the res, even today and she saved it for my dad because she knew he loved them. And then one night in 1966, he remembers when she went out looking for her husband, Jacob, who was out drinking in a blizzard and she froze to death. After Alice was gone, there were no noise cats in the whole world until my father married, reclaimed her name and passed it on to me. Remember who you are. Be true to who you are. There's power in that. But also remember that the power of identity is not individual. It's plural. It's collective. The next thing I did when I introduced myself in my language was I put myself in relation to my family and my people. And here, I should acknowledge that praising boomers probably isn't the wisest decision given the general state of things. As young people, we have certainly inherited far too many problems from our elders, climate change included. But that said, I think it's important to remember, remember that we are not alone, that we have relatives, that we are in fact all related and not just us humans. The other than human world shares some of our DNA too. If we remember that, maybe we will recognize that our fates are also interrelated. Over the last five years, my father and I have participated in the tribal canoe journey. It's an annual indigenous gathering on the West Coast where tribal people organized into what are called canoe families get in their ocean going vessels and paddle for days and even weeks across the seas. At the end of those voyages, we converge on a single community for a week long celebration of food, gifts, speeches, dances, and songs. My father wasn't around for most of my childhood. He was struggling with alcoholism and the demons inherited from St. Joseph's and the cycles of poverty, dysfunction, and abuse it unleashed on Canham Lake. 
But the canoe journeys have brought us back together and they helped us recognize the importance of family. You see, the beautiful thing about the canoe is that it quickly teaches you that if you want to go anywhere, you need other people. You need a family. You need to go together. Pulling alongside dozens of members of canoe families that welcomed, welcomed us into their vessels with open arms, my father and I have traveled across international borders and hundreds of miles of ocean. We've made countless friends, learned dozens of new songs, and visited many magical places. We've been inspired. And in 2019, we were inspired to bring the canoe journey to Alcatraz Island. That year marked the 50th anniversary of the Alcatraz occupation, a 19-month protest for indigenous self-determination, sovereignty, and treaty rights. I need you to understand how important the Alcatraz occupation was to indigenous peoples. It's like our version of the Montgomery bus boycott. It launched a social movement that changed the hearts and minds of native and non-native people across the country and around the world. Alcatraz made Indians proud to be Indian again, and it transformed federal policy. During the occupation, President Nixon, the, the friggin' Watergate guy, shifted the federal government's policy from an officially stated goal of termination to one of self-determination. Working with our own canoe family, which we called the Occupied Canoe Family, my mother, father, and gr group of friends that included a youth worker and an Alcatraz occupation veteran organized a paddle around Alcatraz Island on Indigenous Peoples Day in 2019. 18 canoes, including some from as far north as Canada, participated. Dozens of media outlets covered the story. A local TV station broadcasts the canoes circumnavigating the island from its traffic helicopter. Our little all-volunteer effort even made it into the New York Times. And for a day, Alcatraz was not seen as the former federal prison, but instead as a symbol of indigenous freedom, the way native people see it. We can do a lot together when we recognize the fact that we need relatives, that we need family. Every time my father and I got out onto the water, we rekindled and deepened our connection to the seas and places that gave us our Salish culture. And in my introduction, I also told you where I come from. Canem Lake, called Tzk'eschen in our language, and Oakland, the town by the bay that raised me. I also acknowledge that today I'm speaking to you from Washington, D.C., the homeland of the Piscataway people, and that you all in Marin are on the territory of the Coast Miwok and Ohlone. It was a very cosmopolitan land acknowledgement, one that it's in its head splitting multiplicity demonstrated how our synthetic Zoom connected internet reality can dislocate us from a meaningful relationship to the places where we are. I think that's dangerous because if we don't stop to remember and honor the places we come from and rely upon, how can we possibly defend them? Earlier this year, I was asked to write an essay for the Paris Review celebrating the Kiowa author N. Scott Mamaday, who was the first Native American to win the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. While reporting that piece, I discovered that Mamade actually taught one of the original student leaders of the Alcatraz occupation. Her name was Lenata Warjack, and in 1968, she became the first Native American student at UC Berkeley. Now, although Mamade never got involved with the Alcatraz occupation or the Native rights movement, Warjack told me that his lectures influenced her profoundly. So in my reading, reporting, and writing, I set out to understand the ethic at the core of his work, the worldview it grew out of, and the movements it continues to influence. Rereading his books, I noted a brief postscript in my 2010 edition of the Pulitzer Prize winning Housemaid of Dawn. It read, both consciously and subconsciously, my writing has been deeply informed by the land with a sense of place. In some important way, place determines 
who and what we are. I am Tzikeskanemk, a person from Canem Lake, a place we call Broken Rock in our language. But I am also a son of Oakland, a visitor in Washington, D.C., and now a virtual guest of Bioneers. My connection to those places and others is also an imperative. It demands that I remember, honor, and protect those patches of earth. Now that we are in dialogue and relation, I believe that you are asked to do the same. You might be thinking that I sound exceptionally proud of being Indian, and I'm certainly guilty of that. But this, this is not mere identity politics. What I'm saying, what I'm thinking through in the book I'm writing and the film I'm making is that a broader humanity facing the apocalypse of climate change might have a thing or two to learn from a people who've lived through the near total loss of our own worlds, that indigenous peoples have something important to say if you're willing to give us an audience like you have given me today. That there might be even ways that our humanity and our collective future can be brightened if you have it in your heart to believe that the civilizing mission was wrong, that the St. Joseph's missions of the world had it all backwards, that in fact, in the long run, it's all of you that have something to learn from all of us that maybe America, Canada, and the so-called civilized world should become just a little bit more indigenous rather than the other way around. The United Nations says that climate change is nothing less than code red for humanity. It is already brutalizing many of the places we come from and rely upon. It is driving us apart, making us forget that we are not just interconnected but interrelated. We are all kin. And if we're not careful, climate change is going to make us forget who we are. Animals of remarkable intellect, capable of immense care and compassion, even when grave injustice has laid us low. So my message for you today is simple. Remember who you are. Remember that you have many relatives, human and non-human. And remember that we all come from somewhere and that those places and the place called Earth need us to fight for them. <laughs>